Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third session for today. We have Drew Myers, who will teach us how not to get burned out. I know he went jogging this morning, so I hope it's not one of the one of the deals. Let's check. Welcome, Drew Myers. Thanks, Maya. I played American football in the early 90s. And while my teammates were listening to rock and roll and rap before every game, I couldn't do that because I'd get too worked up. Do you guys know who the monkeys are? The monkeys are a fictitious American band from the 60s, okay? They had a song, here we come walking down the street, get the funniest looks from everyone we meet. Hey, hey, we're the monkeys. Real kind of corny. Well, when before I played in football games, I would sing that song in my head to calm me down. Well, coming into the summit, I wasn't really that nervous. This is my first time to travel internationally, but I still wasn't nervous. I've done this keynote hundreds of times, so I'm not, not nervous. Right before, while Andy's speaking, right before this, I get a text message from Texas, where I'm from. It's from my business partner, and she says, don't screw it up. So for the last 30 minutes, I've been singing the theme song to the monkeys in my head to calm me down because I've been nervous. Guys, I'm super excited about this opportunity. I'm so grateful to Maya and the entire um, booking manager team for allowing me to come in and do this because this is my favorite thing to do. I do a lot of things. I do one-on-one -on -one coaching. I wrote a book. I host a podcast and a radio show. But standing in front of a group of people, Generating hope, inspiring action, and reminding people to make the important things important is my favorite thing to do. And that's my message. Make the important things important. I don't save it to the end. I don't hide it. Make the important things important. My biggest fear is that you guys leave here today. You leave this session and you're out there visiting with somebody having a cup of coffee. You're like, oh, I heard this really handsome bald man from Texas talk. And they're like, oh, what do you talk about? And you can't remember. That terrifies me. Make the important things important. So what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to share part of my story. I'm going to drive home, make the important things important. I'm going to give you three challenges, and I've got one story. Before we get started, though, I do have three disclaimers. And I know what you're thinking. You're only going to be up there about 45 minutes. You have three disclaimers. Yes, I've done this before. Bear with me. Disclaimer number one is I realize that 99.9% .9 of the people in the room have no idea who I am. It's okay. It doesn't matter. I'm okay with it. I need you to be okay with it, and this is why. Because it's not about me. Yes, I'm going to share my story, but it's not about me. It's about the message. Make the important things important. Disclaimer number two. A lot of the things that I say on this stage today aren't going to be breaking news. You've heard it before. But I encourage you to stay with me, and this is why. I was speaking back in Texas once, spoke to the group, and this lady runs up to me. She gets this close to me, and she goes, you didn't say anything I didn't already know. I didn't say anything. I just stood there because I knew she had something else on her mind. And she goes, but you said it in a way that it resonated this time. And that's my hope today. I say something that you've heard before, but today it sticks. That's disclaimer number two. Disclaimer number three, and this is important. I need every single person in the room to recognize and admit that you live a blessed life. I have a checklist that I run down real quick. Did everybody wake up this morning, whether you woke up at home or you woke up in a hotel room, that the heating and air conditioning was working properly, right? The HVAC was working, yeah. Maybe you had the window open, it was really nice in the room, okay? Had a roof over your head. You woke up and you had clothes in the closet, clean clothes in the closet or in the dresser drawers, probably smelled like bounce fabric softener, right? Food in the refrigerator or in the cupboard. It's hard for me to see from upstage, but everybody have shoes on today? Everybody's got shoes on? Oh, blessings. We take those blessings for granted. There are a lot of people in this world that don't have those things. And the reason why I bring it up to start off every keynote that I do is because when you need to make a change in your life, because we live blessed lives, we don't have to make wholesale changes. We can make little tweaks here and little tweaks there. We don't have to drive the car off the road, through the ditch, across the field, and into the river. Little tweaks here, little tweaks there. All right? So let's jump into it. Here's my story. 
Now, this is why I want to tell you my story. Again, it's not about me. It's about the message. Make the important things important. But I love story. Everything that I do revolves around story. From my podcast and radio show, my book is about story, speaking, coaching, all of it is story related. And this is why. Because story is what differentiates everybody from everybody else. Now, I'm going to say something that makes a lot of people feel uncomfortable. It makes people feel uncomfortable because it's the truth. Every single person in this room is a masterpiece. You are one of a kind and you are beautiful. Our story celebrates that rarity and that beauty. When God made each and every one of us, he broke the mold. There never has been and there never will be another you or another me. Again, story celebrates that rarity and that beauty. So I couldn't stand up in front of you guys today and not walk the walk. Because if I did, I'd just be talking the talk. So here's my story real quick. I grew up in Texas, Dallas, Texas to be exact. I went to school at a small state school about two hours northwest of Dallas called Midwestern State University. No one in this room has heard of it. It's okay. I was a long-haired, narcissistic journalism major. My hair was down to here. Everybody kind of giggles when I say that. I don't know why. I'm bald now. But I wrote for the school paper, and I wrote a column called A Different Perspective. And I wrote about hard-hitting things like showering in the dark, fishing shows, and what if I changed my name from Drew Myers to Love Myers? What would that look like? Real hard-hitting journalism, right? The point of my column was to get people to think differently. Now, this shows up again later in my life, but after I graduated from Midwestern, I had the distinction of having 11 jobs in 11 years. I tell people I was a millennial before millennials. My dad told me when I was growing up, if you're not happy with what you're doing, go do something else. So I wrapped both of my arms around that and I squeezed real, real tight. I was everything from a newspaper guy, that's what I went to school for. I went back to Midwestern, I worked in the admissions office, working with students. Then I said, you know what? I wanna go coach college football. So that's what I did, American football. I ended up at a major division one university, Texas Christian University, TCU, go Frogs. Worked my way up. I was the first ever director of communications in the athletic department at TCU. Again, a major division one university in Texas. Got bored doing that, started my own business. That business failed. Then I slowly started working my way back into the real world. I was a consultant. I worked for an ad agency, I worked for an oil and gas company doing marketing for them, and the last real job that I had is I sold real estate. Now, my grandfather was longtime real estate, my dad was a real estate broker, and I thought, oh, this is what I'm supposed to do, and I hated it. But what it did do is it moved my family to a little town outside of Fort Worth, Texas called Glen Rose. Glen Rose is about this big, and technically, I live in Rainbow, Texas, which is a suburb of Glen Rose. So Glen Rose is this big, Rainbow is this big. Tiny, tiny community. Moved my family down there, and my broker at the time changed the trajectory of my life. Because he said, hey, they're moving a radio station to Glen Rose, and I think you should go to lunch with the owners. Now, I think he wanted me to sell them a house. Well, they offered me a job. We were sitting in this little restaurant in Glen Rose, just off the square, it's called the Green Pickle, and I was eating a bacon cheeseburger, and I told them about 11 jobs in 11 years, newspapers, sports, and Mike Green, owner of 95.3 KOME, where country and rock come together, he said, do you want to be our news and sports director on our morning show? Guys, I did not even let him finish asking the question. I was like, I want some of that. Give me that. I was hating real estate, but the thought of being on the radio really appealed to me. So the idea was... I'd show up at the radio station between 4.45 and 5 o'clock in the morning. I'd get the news and sports together. We'd go on the air at 6. I'd be off the air at 9. Then I was supposed to go back to the real estate office and list and sell houses. But again, I hated real estate, so I never left the radio station. And not that there was anything going on. I think the highlight of our day at the radio station would be like the tractor club would drop off their flyer so we could talk about it on the morning show the next day. It's not like we had these, you know, rock and roll stars coming in and out of the radio station. It wasn't like that. Glen Rose, Texas is this big. So after the morning show one time, Mike and Julie said, hey, we need you to stay around. I thought they were going to fire me, honestly. And they said, you're always here. I said, I know, I love it here. 
they said, we can't pay you any more money. And they weren't paying me that much money to begin with. I said, it's okay, you don't have to pay me any more money. I said, give me my own show. Give me my own radio show. Sunday night's two hours. And Mike Green looks at me and he goes, what would your show be about? Okay, pause the story. Rewind to those 11 jobs in 11 years. During that time, I started to write again, like I did in college. I started to write a blog. On that blog, I wrote about things that I knew or things that I loved. Okay, I wrote about being newly married. I wrote about buying my first house. I, bought about, I wrote about my first dog. Shout out to Captain Woodrow Call. I wrote about the Texas Rangers baseball team. I love the Texas Rangers. I wrote about Texas music. I love Texas music. And three people read my blog, and I'm not even kidding. My mother, one of my sisters, not even both of my sisters, one of my sisters, and a girl named Amy Bennett. Now, I knew Amy read my blog because she sent me an email, and it said, hey, I think you should do this thing and then write about it on your blog. Now, this thing was to make a list of 101 things to do in 1,001 days. I said, oh, that sounds really stupid. Delete. Amy Bennett, very persistent, sends me another email. She goes, no, seriously, make a list, mark stuff off, write about it on your blog. Delete. And you know what it reminded me of? You guys may not remember this, but when emails first started to come out, it was like, forward this email to 15 people or you're going to get eaten alive by crickets, right? That's what it reminded me of. It sounded stupid. But again, she was persistent and broke me down. So I said, if I made a list of 101 things to do in 1,001 days, what would be on there? Five things turned into 10 things, turned into 25 things, turned into 50 things, and before I knew it, I had a list of 101 things to do in 1,001 days. Some of those things were little, like eat a double scoop of ice cream. I had never done that for whatever reason. Eat lobster was on this first list. Now, I know why that one was on there. I'll tell that story real quick. When I was probably in junior high, we went to a seafood restaurant, and the waiter came to me and said, what would you like? And I ordered lobster. And my mother, shout out to Kay Myers, she goes, oh, honey, we only order lobster on a special occasion. Well, I guess it was never a special enough occasion the rest of my life, so I never ordered lobster again. So I put that on my list. Those were some little things, some big ticket items. I wanted to throw out a first pitch at a Major League Baseball game. I wanted to meet the president. I wanted to summit a 14,000-foot mountain in Colorado. Okay, little things, big things, and everything in between. Then I started to do these things. The first thing I ever did, I went to a wine tasting. I had never been to a wine tasting. Then I wrote about it on the blog. Second thing I ever did, Craigslist. Is that a thing here? Or was a thing, Craigslist, where you sell something online? Well, I've never done that. So I sold a cast iron sink to some random dude in Fort Worth, Texas. He shows up at my house. We jump in the back of his pickup. I take a selfie with me, this random guy, in a cast iron sink. I write about it on the blog. The cool thing that happened after that is, one, people started to read the blog. But the really cool thing is, people started making lists of their own. Their own lists of 101 things to do in 1,001 days. Two of those people were my friends Dave and Kimbra Quinn. They lived out in West Texas, and about a year after they made their list, I went out to see them. And Dave and I are sitting at his house drinking cold beer, and I said, hey, Dave, where is your list of 101 things to do in 1,001 days? He said, I don't, I don't know, I don't know. I said, well, go find it. Let's mark something off this weekend while I'm here. Now, mine's published online for the world to see. Dave had to go into his room and, like, dig in his underwear drawer to find this list. Brings it back out, and it's written on a piece of legal notebook paper. And I start to go down this list of things that we could do, possibly do that weekend. And one of them was to see Tim McGraw, who's a popular country music artist. And he was nowhere near this town that we were in, so we weren't going to do that. Dave also had to get a massage on there, and I don't think he wanted me to lay him down on his couch and rub his back. That's not what he had in mind. But at the bottom of his list was make chocolate cake for his wife, Kimbra. Now, the backstory there, real quick, when they were going to school at Texas A&M University, they were dating, and Dave would always make Kimbra chocolate cake. But then they got married, had kids, life happened, and he stopped doing it, so he wanted to do it again. I said, Dave, let's do this. Let's make chocolate cake for Kimbra. Dave, rah, rah, rah. no, no, no. We're drinking cold beer. It's been a long work week. We're watching the kids, all the excuses in the world. 
why we couldn't do this thing, this little thing. I said, stop. You drank half a beer, you're good. I'll watch the kids. Kimra's still at work. Go get a cake mix. Let's do this thing. Something finally clicked in his head, and that's what he did. Runs to the store, comes back, whips it all up, gets it in the oven. So when Kimbra walks into the house, the house smells just like chocolate cake. Right, good job. Kimbra says, what's going on? Dave said, it was on my list to make you chocolate cake, and that's what we did. And it was almost as if somebody texts Kimbra on the way home. And told her what we were doing. Because she immediately says, I want to mark something off my list. I want to eat that chocolate cake on my grandmother's fine china. Using her grandmother's fine china was on her list. So after dinner that night, we ate homemade chocolate cake on Kimbra's grandmother's fine china. Cool story, right? But the really cool part of the story is the conversation that we had around their dining room table. We talked about these lists We talked about how we could help each other mark other things off their list. Right then and there, I turned mine into a gigantic thank you note to God. I had lived a blessed life, and I wanted to live life. I did not want to thank God by laying on the couch and binge watching whatever TV show and eating spicy Cheetos. I wanted to live life. I also started calling it a life list. It's a lot like a bucket list, right? But a bucket list are things we want to do before we kick the bucket, before we die. But here's the thing. We all think we're going to live forever, so we never do those things. I wanted to put an emphasis on the life. So when Mike Green, owner of 95.3, the new radio station in Glen Rose, Texas, said, hey, what is your show going to be about? That's what it was going to be about. I wanted to bring people on my radio show. I wanted to hear their story because I love story. We've already established that. And I wanted to ask every single guest if they had a life list. If they did, we'd talk about it. If they didn't, we'd brainstorm a list for them. I brought on authors, professional athletes, singer-songwriters on the Texas music scene. Did I mention I love the Texas music scene? I brought on people from my small town of Glen Rose that just had a cool story. And after every single conversation, I asked them if they had a life list or a bucket list. Now, the really cool part of the story is at the end of every show, I'd ask to see that list. Because remember this, it's fun to make a life list, and it's neat to mark stuff off, but when you can put other people's goals, dreams, and aspirations in the spotlight and help them mark something off their list, it is a game changer. And that's what I wanted to do. I couldn't help everybody, but I could help some people, and I want to share one of those stories real quick. Singer-songwriter on the Texas music scene. Her name's Caitlin Butts. She came on my show. I hear her story. Did she have a life list? She didn't. So we started to brainstorm. And she started throwing things out that she wanted to do. Play the Grand Old Opry. She wanted to play in Red Rocks, a very popular venue in Colorado. And then she says, just matter-of-factly, I want some baby donkeys. I said, whoa, time out. Baby donkeys, what? Why? They had just moved to a little community in Oklahoma called Ardmore, her and her mom. And they said they take a special route home to drive by these baby donkeys. And she would love to give her mom some baby donkeys. And I said, Katie Butts, I've got two baby donkeys in Rainbow, Texas that I need to get rid of. Six weeks later, I loaded those donkeys in the back of our horse trailer, took my entire family across the Red River, and dropped off Thelma and Louise to Caitlin Butts and her mom. If you go on Caitlin Butts' Instagram page, you can scroll down. She doesn't have them anymore. But you scroll down, you'll see those donkeys. Caitlin Butts and I will be tied together for the history of forever by two baby donkeys. Why that was important to her, I don't know. Donkeys aren't important to me. They're probably not important to you guys. But to her and her mother, they were. And I was able to help her make that happen. It's cool to make a life list, fun to mark stuff off, game changer if you can help somebody else put their goals, dreams, and aspirations in the spotlight. So on this radio show, I would have those conversations regularly, hundreds of conversations like that. I would also say live on purpose. I would also remind people that life is short, life is precious, we need to act accordingly. I would tell people to put their goals, dreams, and aspirations in the spotlight because that's where they belong. Now, you guys are sitting there and you said, that's not your message, though. No, it's not. It's changed. Now my message is make the important things important. All those other things are good, but they fall under this umbrella of make the important things important. And I changed my messaging when two things happened. I want to tell those stories to you guys real quick. Story number one is, on my first life list of 101 things to do in 1,001 days, was to go to Big Bend. Big Bend is a national park in Texas. 
and it is absolutely gorgeous. I grew up in Texas. I had never been to Big Bend. Now, it's also important to know that after that first life list expired, I made a second life list of 55 things to do in 555 days. I just cut it in half. So Big Ben was on my first one, didn't do it. Excuse, excuse, excuse. Second life list, Big Ben was on there, didn't do it. Excuse, excuse, excuse. Third life list, I finally said, no more excuses, I'm going to Big Ben. This was my plan. Solo trip to Big Ben, which is far from where I lived. It was probably a seven-hour drive. I was going to do everything in the park, going to summit the highest peak. I was going to strip down to my underwear and get in the hot spring. I was going to camp out underneath the stars. And then I was going to go to a music festival in the little town just north of the park. And I know you have no frame of reference here, but just Texas is big, little pocket down here, Big Bend, Marathon, Texas right here. Now, I planned this trip. I'm super pumped about it. My sisters decided to give, throw my mom her 75th birthday that same weekend in Rainbow. So the, the old me would have been like, oh, I can't go. I'll just do it. I'll do it next time. Do it next year. Do it next spring break. Whatever. I said, no. No more excuses. Moved my trip up a day. Decided to stay at the music festival only one day. Be back in time for the birthday party in Rainbow. Well, I'm telling this to a friend of mine in Marathon at the Songwriter Festival. His name's Walt Wilkins. He has long hair, steely blue eyes. He's a kind of a real soulful hippie. And I tell him the story, and he goes, Drew, I'm glad you're doing that because that's important. And I don't know if it was the way he said it, the look in his eye when he said it, or the music playing in the background, but he planted a seed inside my soul. Now, six weeks later, that seed was unfortunately watered when a friend of mine named Kylie Ray Harris, also a singer-songwriter on the Texas music scene, was killed in an automobile accident outside of Taos, New Mexico. Um... Kylie Ray had been on my show in March. We weren't best friends, but we were friends. I really get to know my guests when they come on my show. And Kylie Ray made two stupid decisions. She drank too much and she drove too fast, and she killed herself and a 16-year-old girl outside of Taos. And it rocked my world. Young, beautiful, talented, a mama. Two stupid decisions. And it was gone. And it was over. And after she died, I did not think about Kylie Ray Harris's life list. I wondered, did Kylie Ray Harris make the important things important? Did her daughter, Corby, know how much her mama loved her? And the answer to these, all these questions are yes. Spoiler alert. Did Corby know how much her mom loved her? Yes. Did Kylie Ray's mom know how much Kylie Ray appreciated her so she could chase her dreams? Again, yes. Did her friends in the music scene know how much she loved and cared about them? Again, yes. My friend Walt Wilkins planted the seed. The death of my friend Kylie Ray Harris watered that seed. And since that moment, I've been traveling around the country primarily, now the world, telling people to make the important things important. Again, all that stuff I used to say, live on purpose, stop saying I'll do it tomorrow, goals, dreams, and aspirations in the spotlight are good. But make the important things important is powerful, and I'm about to drive that point home. A little audience participation real quick. I'm not going to ask anybody to stand up. All you're going to do is you're going to close your eyes for where you are. And you are going to rapid fire, go through your head for 10 seconds, the important things in your life. Because what I love about this charge is I can't tell you what's on your list. You have to decide what's important and put an emphasis on that. Close your eyes, 10 seconds, don't make it weird. Go ahead. What's important to you? You can be very specific, you can be very broad. Okay, open your eyes. Now, I will make some assumptions of some things that are possibly on your list, but I need to get this out of the way. Now, in America, a lot of times um, the audience gets confused and they don't understand what we're doing, okay? Hopefully you guys understand what's happening here, okay? I just need to get this out of the way. If one of the following three things was on your list, I need you to raise your hand, okay? So if this was on your list, you raise your hand. 
Snapchat, Instagram, or YouTube? Oh, dang it, you guys don't understand either. <laughs> if it's on your list, you're supposed to raise your hand. Snapchat, Instagram, YouTube. No? Good. But guys, the statistics say otherwise. Now, I had to look these up. Normally, I do it, you know, the average American spends X number of hours on social media, but I did Europeans. Here we go. And just for the record, um, America is a lot worse. The, the American numbers are obscene, but here they are for people in Europe. You guys spend, on average, an hour and 15 minutes a day on social media, which is actually not bad. Americans spend like three hours a day. But that comes to 456 hours a year or 19 full days. 19 full days of social media every year. TV is what gets you guys. Four hours a day, the average European, that's 1,460 hours a year. That's 60 full days of television. This is Texas math, but that's 79 full days of screen time. You said it wasn't important. I'm just saying the statistics say otherwise. Just something to think about for the rest of the summit and as you go home. Now let me make some assumptions of some things that were on your list. You don't have to raise your hand. I can tell if this was on your list. I can tell by the nods or the, the look in your eye. Food, water, shelter. Were those on anybody's list? It's okay if they were because those are important things, okay? Next time somebody has you make a list of important things, go ahead and put those on there. Food, water, shelter, you need those things to live, okay? Important. What about time? Was time on your list? Should be. Time is a commodity. We only have so many hours every day, and we only have so much time while we're here on earth. It's probably a safe assumption that other people were on your list, right? Maybe it was a specific person. Maybe it was your spouse or your kiddos, or maybe it's your mom or your dad, Right? Other people, absolutely. Relational joy is a real thing. This next one isn't an assumption, it's kind of a hope and a wish. And again, you do not have to raise your hand. I've been doing it long enough that I know that a majority of the people did not put this on their list. How many of you guys put yourself? There's a couple hands in the room. But again, a majority of the room did not. Because we live in a world, a world where if we make ourselves a priority, we think we're being selfish. I'm trying to flip that on its head. I'm trying to change that because I'm a firm believer that if you're not making yourself a priority, you can't pour into other people. You cannot be a light for the world around you. You cannot be the best yacht broker. You cannot be the best skipper. You can't be the best speaker. You can't be the be best event planner. You can't be the best mom, the best dad, the best CEO until you make yourself a priority. Walt Wilkins planted the seed, Kylie Ray Harris's death watered that seed. Make the important things important became my message, but I added three important words. Make the important things important starting with you. If you just make it about you and you don't pour into other people, yes, it's selfish. But when you make yourself a priority and you pour into other people and there is a ripple effect from you making you number one, it is very, very powerful. I'm giving you permission right now, not that you needed my permission, to make yourself a priority. So you can pour into others and be a light for the world around you. So how do you do that? Now, if I had more time, we could talk about 10 to 20 things you could do. I'm going to give you three. Okay, the first one is over the top simple. Everybody can do it right here, right now for the rest of this conference. Please stop using the word busy. Because it's not a busy thing, it's a priority thing. If you move, remove busy from your vocabulary, you remind yourself of that, that it's not a busy thing, it's a priority thing. Because the problem is, guys, we're lying to ourselves that we're too busy. If something is important enough to you, you will do it, I promise you. Have you gone to lunch with your best friend? No, just been too busy. Have you called your mom? Nope, been so busy. Did you go on that cruise with your family? Nope, haven't been able to do that. Too busy. 
I heard this recently, and I've been saying it from the stage. What if you changed busy to not a priority? Here's the example. Have you called your mom? No. It's not a priority to me. Whoa. That's pretty, that's pretty heavy, right? It's the same thing. Remove it from your vocabulary. Two things are going to happen. Two things. Thing number one is you're going to catch yourself how often you say busy. And the second thing is you're going to hear other people say busy. And every time that happens, just remind yourself to remove it from your vocabulary. You can say something else. We all have a lot going on. I say ripping and running. It means the exact same thing. But removing that from my vocabulary reminds me that I'm not too busy, that it's a priority thing. Make the important things important starting with you by removing busy from your vocabulary. Thing number two is we have to start paying attention to how we talk to ourselves. Everybody talk to themselves? Yeah, right? I like talking to really big groups because there's normally some dude in the very back that's like, I don't talk to myself. That guy's crazy. Are you kidding me? Who talks to themselves? Only crazy people talk to themselves. I mean, he's having a conversation inside his head, you know, while he's denying that he talks to himself. Here's the problem. A lot of times when we talk to ourselves, it's ugly, mean, and it's destructive. And if we tell ourselves those lies enough, we start to believe those lies. I hit rock bottom in 2019, just a couple years ago. And the thing that pulled me out of the darkness were affirmations and prayer. I want to share my affirmations with you guys real quick. I wrote them in my journal here to give you an idea of what an affirmation is. Here they are written kind of in a mind cloud format. I read them clockwise, and then I bounce around real quick, and then I end each day with something that really resonates with me. So it'll be different every day. Here's some examples. Be curious. Life is glorious. I will break through. Perfection is BS. I deserve all of God's blessings. God's love is enough. I do make the important things important. Quitting is not an option. I am worthy. Be kind. Failure is not fatal. I will succeed. I am inspiring. I do live on purpose. I do love hard. No excuses. I on the ball. I am not perfect. Get out of my own way. Love wins. Stay in the fight. I am strong. What's cool is if you remind yourself of those truths and affirmations, you start to believe that instead of the BS lies that we're telling ourselves. Make the important things important starting with you by paying attention to how you talk to yourself. And the last thing that you can do to make yourself a priority, we've already talked about it. Put your goals, dreams, and aspirations in the spotlight. Make a life list. It doesn't have to be 101 things to do in 1,001 days. It doesn't have to be 55 things to do in 555 days. My sister made a life list of five things that she wanted to do, and she told me, she goes, Drew, I will mark them off when I'm good and ready. It was like... See Dolly Parton in concert, go on a trip in an RV and learn how to make a perfect martini and a couple other things. That was her list. She owned it. There is something very powerful about stopping for a second, clearing the mechanism, and writing down on a sheet of paper, because the key is writing it down, writing down on a sheet of paper, what do you want to experience? Where do you want to go? Who do you want to meet? What do you want to eat? What do you want to learn how to do? What have you failed out before, but you want to try again? What is something that somebody said you could not do and you want to prove them wrong? And then you write it on a sheet of paper and then you take steps, action, to accomplish those goals. And guys, there is something so powerful. When you take a pen and you mark one of those things off. Because before the pen leaves the paper, the next response, without a doubt, no questions asked, is what's next? What do I want to do next? It is a snowball effect. There is momentum. It is very, very powerful. When you make this life list, I encourage you to inspire somebody else to make a life list. And I also encourage you to help somebody else put their goals, dreams, and aspirations in the spotlight by helping them mark something off their life list. I've said it before and I'll say it again. It's fun to make a life list and to mark stuff off. Game changer when you can help somebody else do that, though. Make the important things important starting with you. By making a life list and putting your goals, dreams, and aspirations in the spotlight. So I said we were going to close things down with a story. We actually have time for three stories to drive this point home. Okay? Story number one is kind of a tragic story. I like to follow it up with some feel-good stories after that. Story number one is about uh, a death. 
on my life list was to be a volunteer firefighter. I grew up in Dallas, Texas, major metropolitan area. You cannot walk into the fire department and say, hey, when do I get to drive the fire truck? But now I lived in Glen Rose, Texas, and you, can, you could do that. So I wanted to give back. So I went in and I interviewed, and the chief asked me, do you think you could pull a dead body from a car? Now remember, I went to school at Midwestern State University, long-haired narcissistic journalism major. I said, oh yeah, I could probably do that. Well, December of 2016, I had to do that. We go out to the county line, and it was a drunk driving accident. Typical tr drunk driving accident. Drunk guy lives, sober guy dies. I'm the third truck there, and I get out, and I had been in many bars in my life at that point, but I never smelled beer so pungent on that roadside. It punched me in the face. So I knew immediately it was a drunk driving accident. We get the drunk guy out of his car, get him in the ambulance. He's headed to Glen Rose. Then it's time to get the victim out of his car. And it's bad. It's real bad. Dashes pushed up into him. We had to roll the dash and cut him out. Three things stood out to me that night. Thing number one, because it took some time, his cell phone was sitting on the, um, the front seat of the truck. Somebody had, it like got thrown and then somebody had sat it there and it was ringing. Ringing, ringing, ringing. None of us, none of the firefighters were qualified to answer that. Only the justice of the peace could answer that call and tell whoever was on the other end what had happened. All I was thinking about was, man, somebody is looking for this guy and he's not there. The second thing that stood out to me is, here's the gurney. We're putting him in the body bag, about to zip him up. And the funeral home says, we got to get his wedding ring off. And his hand was swollen from the trauma, and it was cold that night, and they're trying to get it off, and they can't get it off. So all I'm thinking about is his wife, who's probably the one calling on the phone. But the last thing that I thought of was the time of year it was. It was late December, right before New Year's. This guy probably had big dreams for 2017, New Year's resolutions, was driving home for work, and because some a-hole drank too many bush lights, boom, it was over. Life is short. Life is precious, and we need to act accordingly. I call them life is short whispers that remind us of that, okay? That wasn't a life is short whisper. That was a life is short punch to the face. But here's the thing. To start making ourselves a priority, to start making ourselves important, to start making ourselves number one, we don't need the bad phone call at 3 o'clock in the morning. We don't need the bad doctor's diagnosis. Again, you have permission right here, right now, to start living on purpose right now. It's those reminders that we get all the time, those life is short whispers that usually force us into action. I asked a group one time, how many life is short whispers do they think we get over the course of our life? I went around the room and did it. Some people said, you know, a couple dozen. Some people said a couple hundred. This one lady, she goes, I think we get thousands. I said, thousands, really? She said, absolutely. She goes, we probably get a life is short whisper every day, but the problem is we're not listening. Turn on the news, look at your social media feed, talk to your friends. There are reminders around us constantly that life is short, life is precious, we need to act accordingly. At that county line, that particular night, again, I got a life is short punch to the face. It wasn't just a whisper. Story number two. Somebody asked me once what was my favorite all-time thing to mark off my life list. I didn't have a really good answer that night, but now I do. When my son was four years old, I took him camping. That was on the list to do. Now, my son's name is Crash. There's a movie called Bull Durham. The main character's named Crash Davis. Crash by Dave Matthews was also playing when I proposed to my wife. So we call him Crash. It fits him perfectly. Everybody knows him as Crash. I took Crash camping when he was four. We were coming off the 4th of July weekend, which is a big deal in the United States. All my family came down to Rainbow, we did all the things, shot off fireworks, did campfires, and we were going to go camping right after that. We were going to go about 25 minutes from the house. And I remember being parked at the gate, waiting for the gate to open. We've got the tent in the back, we've got bikes in the back, fishing poles, sleeping bags, everything. And I was making up every excuse in the world why we shouldn't go. Coming off a long weekend, I don't know if you guys know this, but Texas in July is sweltering. I was like, it's too hot. We're not going to go. We're not going to go. Coming, you know, 
I was doing real estate at the time. I was hating it, but I was like, what if my clients need me? Blah, 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 excuse, excuse, excuse. And I gave my excuse the middle finger. That gate opened, and we left. 25 minutes from the house, that's it. We camped for two days, and we did all the things. We caught fireflies. We made a campfire and ate s'mores. We went fishing, hiking, bike riding, swimming. We did it all, and it was awesome. Giving my excuses the middle finger made that a cool story. But the really cool part of that story, and why it's my favorite thing I've ever marked off any life list that I had, that last night, we laid in the tent, and my son Crash made his first life list. Ten things that he wanted to do, and ten people he wanted to do those things with. He wanted to build a sandcastle with his mom. He wanted to build a treehouse with me. He wanted to go fishing with Poppy, who's my father. He wanted to go to a baseball game with his cousins, Jake and Cal. And sometimes I get emotional when I talk about this. I think I'll be okay today. It's probably the jet lag. My son is 12 years old now. And this is how my son talks. Hey, Dad, can we mark something off my life list? Hey, Dad, can we add something to my life list? Ladies and gentlemen, I've interviewed hundreds, hundreds of grown men and women that don't get it. And my 12-year-old son does. That's why that's my favorite thing to mark off my life list. My last story involves a bull. This really has nothing to do with make the important things important. It's just a really good way to close things down. It also involves my son, Crash. On one of my life lists was to teach Crash how to ride a bicycle. And Crash is super athletic. I am bragging. Crash taught himself how to ride a two-wheel bike. My wife takes him to her grandmother's house, sends me a video. Crash is driving around the driveway on a two-wheel bike. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's awesome. But I had nothing to do with that, so I didn't feel right marking off my life list. So I needed to supplement something else on there. I didn't know what it was going to be. Well, Crash was probably four or five at the time, and he loved the song Live Like You Were Dying by Tim McGraw. Do you guys know this song? The lyrics are this. I went skydiving. I went Rocky Mountain climbing. I went 2.7 seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu. And the premise of the song is live like you were dying. Live life to the fullest. YOLO, right? So I remember driving down the road one day, and Crash is back here in his car seat, and he said, hey, Dad, you've jumped out of an airplane, right? You've been skydiving, right, Dad? I said, yeah, it was on my life list. I, I really liked it. Mark it off. Hey, Dad, when you went to Colorado with Uncle Brent, you guys went Rocky Mountain climbing, right? I said, yeah, it was, it was on my life list also. We did two peaks in one day. It was awesome. Mark it off. Then I saw it coming like a freight train. My son said, hey, Dad, when are you going to ride a bull? I said, you want, you want Daddy to ride a bull? And he goes, yes, sir. <laughs> okay, okay. I was like, okay, I'll do that. So I put that on my life list instead of teach Crash how to ride a bike. I put ride a bull. I grew up in Dallas, Texas, major metropolitan area. Ride a bull, good luck. Well, now I was living in Rainbow, Texas, this big. I put it out there on social media, and within five minutes, I'm not even kidding, at a time, a place, and a bull to ride. I was like, oh, poop. Here we go. I go out to this guy's ranch who trains bucking bulls. He brings in professional bull riders to coach me up. They put me head to toe in my stuff, helmet, flak jacket, chaps, spurs, coach me up on what to do, put me in the chute, before the chute opens, the bull tries to jump out this way. No joke, right? A smart man would have gotten off at that point, but my leg was caught and I couldn't get off. They calm the bull down. They calm me down. You ready? You ready? I said, let's ride, and that chute opens. Boom, here we go. And I stayed on that bull. And if you want to clap after I tell you this, feel free. I stayed on that bull for 4.8 seconds. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Long-haired, narcissistic journalism major from Midwestern. 4.8 seconds. It wasn't a dramatic exit. It wasn't YouTube worthy. I kind of slid off the back, hit my butt, jumped up real quick because I didn't want to get horned, right? Run out of the arena. Adrenaline's pumping. I'm like, Terry, let's go. Let's go again. He's like, easy there, cowboy. He goes, drink this Coors Light and sit on that tailgate right there. We'll get back with you in 15 minutes. Well, about 10 minutes into that 15 minutes, I started to stiffen up. Um, I started to think rationally, I guess is the best way to put it. And I thought, if I never go back out there for the history of my life, I will be a bull rider. I said, guys, I'm done. Thank you so much. And I took all my stuff off. 
That's my bull riding story. Again, it has nothing to do with make the important things important. It was important to my son for whatever reason, but it's a good way to end this talk. Make the important things important starting with you. Guys, thank you for this opportunity. I really appreciate it.